But for the Impressionist painter Claude Monet, Normandy was his home, his sanctuary, and his inspiration. He was a child in Normandy, and he died in Normandy at the age of 86. And he painted it throughout his professional life. And yet there'd never been an exhibition that dealt with his own emotional, lifelong fascination with Normandy. Normandy was the place where he became an artist, where he really refined his craft to the point where he was making masterpieces. Monet was one of the great painters of our civilization. He was a master of the Impressionist technique and the dabs of color and the way they play with light. The way that he was able to capture atmosphere and time of day and the moods of the natural world was something that really hadn't been done before. Monet was the greatest Impressionist landscape painter. The landscape that he painted the most and the most frequently and with, with the most fervent attention, even going back 20 years later to places he painted before, was Normandy. Monet in Normandy, next on UNC-TV. A production of UNC-TV and the North Carolina Museum of Art. Funding for this program was made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. And by GlaxoSmithKline, pleased to help bring Monet and Normandy to the people of North Carolina. GlaxoSmithKline, do more, feel better, live longer and by Progress Energy, proud to sponsor Monet in Normandy. It's one more way we're helping communities thrive. Progress Energy, people, performance, excellence. Additional support is provided by American Airlines and the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources. Monet was born in 1840. He was the youngest of the Impressionists. And he was born in Paris, baptized in Paris. Both of his parents were Parisian. And that was rare in the 19th century because Paris was growing like all cities do in modern times. And most people who lived in Paris were born elsewhere, and their parents were born elsewhere. So Monet was this rare commodity. He was called a Parisien de Paris, a Parisian of Paris, from Paris itself. But while still a child, Monet's family moved to the port city of Le Havre on the Normandy coast. And by the time Monet went there in 1845, it was already shifting from a fishing-based and pre-modern world to a world with hotels and little inns and pensions and bathing cabins, which became essentially the first tourist landscape in France beautiful beaches, dramatic cliffs, amazing fields with poppies and all sorts of flowers, beautiful rivers. The Seine runs all the way across Normandy as a province. And over time, all these places would become motifs for Monet, subjects he would return to again and again. Monet's paintings of Normandy are now the focus of a special exhibition at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh. I found that no one had ever done a Monet and Normandy show. And, you know, Normandy is in Monet's blood. David Steele came to me and said, you know, we should build an exhibition around the great Monet paintings that we have. Maybe we could get six or ten paintings to a small focus exhibition. I said, let's focus on making it a major exhibition. So Steele enlisted the help of Impressionist scholar Rick Brattel. As the scope of the exhibition grew, two additional museums joined the partnership, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and the Cleveland Museum of Art. 
Doing a Monet show is a very challenging prospect, borrowing 50 paintings by such a sought-after artist. And the challenge is to get a cross-section of Monet's work in Normandy, to show him working in the region, and to be able to show the arc of his development and his maturity. The arc began in 1864. We start out the show with one of the very earliest pictures he ever painted, this wonderful chapel painting at Enfleur. It's a painting that shows Monet as a young artist. He's, he's still very much under the sway of older masters. This beautifully structured chapel on the right. It's architecture, he's very careful. But then you move over and there's this wonderful grove of trees at the left, which instead of painting every single leaf the way a respectable French artist at this time would have done, for Monet, it's about texture. It's about mass. It's about color. He's already starting to look at the world differently than the previous generation of artists. When Monet was in his 20s, he realized that if you were going to succeed as an artist, you weren't going to succeed in Normandy. You had to succeed in Paris. And so he moved to Paris. He met all sorts of other young artists, many of whom have become famous. And like them, he wanted to make works of art that were really shocking and that had a kind of effect upon the urban population so that he would be noticed. So Monet began experimenting with a new way of painting that would soon become known as Impressionism. Well, Impressionism comes from the word impression, impression, and that is sort of seizing from the world around us a sense of the way that we see things initially. And if you can preserve in painted form, not a kind of tired analysis of a landscape, but the impression, the first impression it makes on you, and you can create a sense of the vividness of human sensibility and of your own sensibility, then you've created an impression. But for Monet to become a successful artist in Paris, his paintings had to be accepted by the Salon. One of his first great Salon paintings, paintings made for the official government-sponsored Salon, is a huge painting that represents the beach of his hometown, near his hometown in Honfleur. And it's a kind of picture which is brown and gray. And it's a painting that was made for the official market. It's much more carefully painted. But after Monet's initial success at the Salon, several of his later paintings were rejected. And there was another matter weighing on his mind. Monet, like all young artists, went to Paris and was living on his own. And when you live in Paris on your own, you live in a world which is pretty dominated by young hormonal males. And so what you do is you meet young women who are models and shop girls and the like, and you develop relationships with them. And he met a young woman who was rather better born than most of the young women of that sort, and her name was Camille Doncieux. And she became his mistress, essentially in the 1860s, and he really did fall in love pretty hard for her, and she became pregnant before they were married. And Monet decided to go home and spill the beans to his dad. And so he did, and his dad was horrified. And his dad advised his son, um, in no uncertain terms, to abandon her. As the drama played out, Monet began to paint. The garden at saint Adresse is probably the most famous picture in the exhibition. It's borrowed from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's certainly one of their most beloved paintings. This is a painting that's in every history of Impressionism. It was certainly the most important picture Monet painted as a young man. And I think in many ways, it's not only Monet's first masterpiece, it's probably the earliest masterpiece of Impressionism. There's a beautiful terrace looking out to the sea, and there are four figures, two seated, two standing, and they're in this wonderful garden of red flowers. We're with Monet on an upper terrace, looking down onto the lower terrace, and we see right in the middle of the painting the parasol of his aunt. 
Madame Lacade, and to her right and our right is Monet's father. And they're looking rather judgmentally over at a young couple. We don't know exactly who they are, but it does seem that the older couple are kind of looking out at the younger couple, passing judgment, scrutinizing them. And then, of course, there are two empty chairs. We can assume that those are the chairs being occupied by the young couple. But there's also the hint that they're the empty chairs for Monet and for Camille, who has not been invited to Santa Dress for this holiday. Shortly after he paints the garden at Santa Dress, Camille gives birth. Monet rushes back to Paris and stands in at the christening of his son as this is my child. Doesn't try to hide the fact that he's the father, he does the right thing. In June of 1870, Monet and Camille get married, and they decide to go to Trouville, this beautiful coastal resort town, very chic, for their honeymoon. I think Monet had two purposes in mind. One, he, of course, wanted to have a nice honeymoon with his bride, but I think his other motive was that he hoped to paint some tourist pictures there. He hoped to avail himself of the patronage of the fashionable tourists who would spend the summer at the beach in Trouville. And Monet goes on to paint five or six pictures that summer, which are almost unique in his work because they show tourists along the boardwalk. They show tourists promenading on this plank walkway, literally on the beach. They show fully dressed. They're in hats and suits and long dresses on the beach because, of course, polite society didn't go to the beach to get tan. They went to the beach to take in the salt air and to be seen by other fashionable tourists. In the early 1870s, Monet was finally able to achieve a measure of financial success so that he was able to buy a small boat, which he converted into this kind of floating studio. And he paints a series of works painted literally on the Seine from his floating boat that shows these ships coming into Rouen, coming into the harbor. This is a radically new idea. Lots of artists had painted Rouen, lots of artists had painted um, scenes from the banks of the river, but Monet, as far as I know, was the first artist to actually get out on the river and paint the river from the river. The French stock market crash of 1878 put an end to Monet's prosperity. His wealthy patron and friend, Ernst Oshede, went bankrupt, and the Monet and Oshede families moved in together to save money. Camille gave birth to Monet's second son, but soon became gravely ill. To make matters worse, Ernst Oshede abandoned his family leaving his wife Alice and six children in Monet's care. And then, in 1879, Camille died. We know that the death of his first wife, Camille, really affected Monet profoundly. Mm -hmm. It was a lingering illness that lasted over a year. And Monet's letters at this time just show the depth of the pain and sorrow that he was undergoing. And Monet goes back to Normandy after Camille dies. And it, he essentially hadn't been for a long time. But he goes back to Normandy, and he goes back to those same beaches and those same dramatic cliffs that he had been on as a boy. And what you see is a kind of world of tough, aggressive nature, waves and battered cliffs and dramatic hillsides. And Monet is essentially pouring himself into empty nature, having sort of failed in every way and being so intensely guilty about the progress of his life to that point that he hurls himself into the nature of childhood. And really, I think it's during the 80s when he's painting along the coast that Monet finally achieves this kind of artistic greatness. It's where he finally becomes his own artist. He paints like no other artist. And it's the sea pictures that really gain him the kind of popularity and financial success that 
makes him the most important artist in France. With Camille now gone, and Ernst Oshadé still estranged from his wife, Monet's relationship with Alice deepened. The relationship between Monet and Alice starts out as a friendship, and it develops into a relationship of mutual respect, as Monet saw Alice taking care of his first wife. After Camille dies, Alice becomes Monet's best friend. She shares his joys and his sorrows, and Monet and Alice eventually become lovers while she's still married to Ernst. And there's no doubt that both Monet and Alice must have suffered because of it. And in fact, shortly after Ernst dies, Monet marries Alice. Monet and Alice would live together for 32 years until her death in 1911. His career began to be more successful in the 1880s. The French economy started rebounding in the early 1880s. He had his first one-man show in 1883 at the Durand-Well Gallery, which sold very well. He was beginning to attract the attentions of a lot more collectors, particularly American collectors. Now, he'd been painting along the Seine um, in this region in southeastern Normandy, and he comes across this little farm village called Giverny, and in there is this beautiful house. It's, it's the biggest house in the town, and so he decides he's going to move this large brood that he has because he has two children of his own. He has his mistress, Alice, who has six children. So it's this menage. So they settle in this beautiful pink farmhouse called Le Pressoir, which means the cider press. They're renting the place at first. Four years later, Monet gets enough money together to actually buy this beautiful pink house. And he begins to work on the gardens. He creates this almost paradise. Giverny finally gives him the opportunity to paint the interior of Normandy, to concentrate on this rich, fertile, agrarian aspect of the province. He paints it in spring. He paints these beautiful poppies that are blooming, fields of poppies near his house. He goes out in the harshness of winter, in a snowstorm practically, to paint this really wonderful lavender-tinted picture of the outbuildings near his house in Giverny. He goes out and paints the grain stacks, the haystacks, very near his house in autumn. You can tell these pictures show, I think, Monet's in love with Giverny. It was also in Giverny that Monet began to paint in series. In 1891, he begins to go out his back door as Giverny and paint the grain stacks that he sees. He goes out either at dawn or at dusk, and he brings with him six or seven canvases, and he paints the fleeting effects of light. You can just imagine him frantically working on five or six of these canvases at once, trying to capture that momentary effect each day over the course of six or seven days or even six or seven months. And this is a radical concept. No one has ever done this. And so he paints these grain stacks and then he shows 15 of them the following year at a gallery in Paris. And he doesn't really know how it's going to go, but the public goes crazy over them. He gets beautiful reviews written. The critics love it, the public love it. He sells these pictures. And all of a sudden, he realizes that it's almost like his public has finally caught up with his vision. So the next year, he goes out and paints a series of poplars that are growing along the banks of one of the tributaries of the Seine near his house. A few years later, he paints a series of works that capture the morning light on this tributary of the Seine called the Ept River. He's in his floating boat studio, and he has with him 15 or 16 canvases, and he paints these momentary effects. 
and the mist gradually lifts and the colors change and the palette gets brighter and brighter. And he does a beautiful series of about 27 paintings of these mornings on the sun, one of which, I mean, one of the most beautiful of which is in the North Carolina Museum of Art. And then he did something which is really surprising for Monet. He decides to go right into the capital of Normandy. And for his subject, he chooses the facade of the great medieval cathedral in Rouen. He never lets it be at home in the canvas. It always goes off the canvas. There is nothing that somebody who likes Gothic architecture would find memorable about this painting because he softens it. You think that you're experiencing the Rouen of Monet's imagination, not the real Rouen. The paintings tell us much more about him than about his motif. He spent many, many years cultivating this image that he only painted out of doors. Somebody asked him, where is your studio? And Monet points to the great outdoors and he says, this is my studio. Well, we know differently. He may have started these works outside and that may be where he captured those beautiful momentary effects of light and atmosphere. But what we also know is that almost every one of his paintings he took back to the studio when he was done outside and worked on them in the studio so that these are products of hard work. We know that for the last 30 years of his life, Monet is obsessed with his garden. And it becomes, I think, an all-consuming passion, which he marries with his other passion, which is his art. And what he missed as he got older and what he wanted to have accessible to him in a direct way in the, in the working day was water. So he began to cultivate water lilies in the pond and to plant the edges of the pond with foliage, both trees and bushes and foliage that sort of drooped into it. What's interesting about these pictures, especially the later ones, is there is no way that you can orient yourself in these pictures. He doesn't give you a hint as to where's the land, where's the sky. All you're doing is looking down into this pond, and it's mesmerizing. You've almost become part of the pond. And I think for Monet, I think really it's become such a personal experience that that's what it is. He can't separate himself from his creation. You know, he's older, he's wiser. He doesn't have to worry about money. He's the richest artist in France. He doesn't have to worry about his reputation. His reputation as France's greatest living artist is absolutely secure. He's the grand old man of French painting. And I think, especially at the end of his life, it gives him the kind of freedom to paint what he wants, how he wants. In 1926, Claude Monet died at his home in Giverny. He was 86. There's an amazing personal quality to these pictures. And I think that's really maybe the strongest point of choosing Monet and Normandy as a theme for an exhibition. You sense the affection that Monet has for what he's painting maybe even an obsession for what Monet is painting. You can look at a single painting and be moved by it, but when you're confronting 50, 51, 52 of these paintings all together and your eye moves amongst them, you cannot help but be emotional. This is a singular opportunity to transport yourself into the mind of an artist in paintings of great quality drawn from all over the world in public and private collections as far away as Tokyo. It is an exhibition of amongst the most beautiful paintings ever made by anyone. And he reveals everything about himself and his moods and his joys and his traumas and his fears through his paintings. 
you have to come and see Monet for yourself. It's a whole new experience. I think that like any great artist, any great work of art, there's no comparison to seeing the real thing face to face. And I think maybe with Monet, it's an even more extraordinary experience because we think we know what we're going to see and we're pleasantly shocked, astonished. When I stand in front of these paintings, my breath is taken away. Funding for this program was made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. And by GlaxoSmithKline, pleased to help bring Monet and Normandy to the people of North Carolina. GlaxoSmithKline, do more, feel better, live longer. And by Progress Energy, proud to sponsor Monet and Normandy. It's one more way we're helping communities thrive. Progress Energy. People. Performance. Excellence. Additional support is provided by American Airlines and the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources. The Monet in Normandy exhibition at the North Carolina Museum of Art runs through January 14, 2007. For more information, call 919-715-5923 or visit the museum's website at www.ncartmuseum.org. Next on member-supported UNC-TV, meet Renee De Rosa, a California art collector who's smitten. Then at 9, Anna DeVere Smith hosts a look at the mystery of love. And at 11, the BBC World News brings you the headlines. UNC-TV, life-changing television for all of North Carolina. A silent killer is on the loose. It's responsible for one death every 20 minutes. In North Carolina alone, it affects 25% of the population. What can you do to keep your heart healthy and stop this killer in its tracks? This is Christine Rogers. Take an in-depth look at heart disease on our next HealthWise special. Thursday night at 8 on member-supported UNC-TV. Thanks to everyone who made UNC-TV's Winterfest a big success. Remember, it's never too late to support UNC-TV, and Winterfest thank you gifts are still available. Pledge online quickly and securely at unctv.org to make your tax-deductible contribution before the end of the year. For those making your payment by check, please return it to UNC-TV as soon as possible so that we may continue life-changing television for North Carolinians statewide. On behalf of all of us at UNC-TV, we wish you and your family a safe and happy holiday season. We're welcoming the new year here at Great Performances. I'm Garrison Keeler, inviting you to a Lake Wobegon New Year's Eve party live from Nashville, singing in the new year with great old American tunes. Join us on Great Performances New Year's Eve. Coming Sunday, December 31st, here on member-supported UNC-TV. Aren't you glad you live in North Carolina? Aren't you glad you can watch UNC TV?
Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by Artists for Art, the Luminous Fountain Group, and the Fleischacker Foundation. I'd love to have a, a horse, a big horse by her like this, but, 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 but. But what? The price of them. What are these so for? 19000 Thank you. It's $20,000. Mama, doggone it. Well, I like it. I never regarded myself as having financial uh, ability to do anything except buy art. It's a beautiful piece. Think about it. I don't collect anything else. I don't travel. I don't uh, do this. I don't do that. I don't do the other thing. I just want to have the money to acquire art. And uh, it is my greatest pleasure. Without it, I can't imagine how to, uh, how to function. When I decided to do the bottle house, it was like, you know, are you crazy? You know, making a house out of 4,000 bottles. When I was at the headlands, this guy came up. I didn't know who he was. He had on a plaid shirt. He may have even had on plaid pants and this crazy uh, tie and a baseball cap. And I was thinking, well, you know, he's a little too smart to be homeless. And he said, I want to buy this house. And I, I thought he was kidding. Is he serious? And he, I found out he was. And that it was like, I couldn't believe it. Someone who is just as crazy as I am. I mean, I made it, and then he wanted to buy it. So it was just great. And it's on a field of maybe five acres. And I remember first seeing it after it was installed, and it was like there was clover. And there was the bottle house. And it just made me really happy. And I know Renee doesn't buy anything he doesn't like. And that's what makes it wonderful. I can just simply say that uh, this particular He said, you're ready to fight the bull. <laughs> Today, I brought Joe to a bloodless bullfight, and now he's about to step in the ring and try to pass her moves on a real-life bull. Where's the bull?
I don't know. For your hair, for your beautiful dress. I don't know. It's it's been a long time since I've been to the opera. So where are we sitting? Come on. Here we go. 